So, awesome to be here. Um, I have seen some of you before in different places throughout the Gold Coast. And uh, so, Tony, Anthony, good to see you, mate. Long time no see. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, Aaron up the back there, another hip hop artist. Spoken word extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, it's awesome to be here. So, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and then just jump straight into the good news. Um, some people don't know how to take me. I can get a little extreme sometimes. You know, I was once, after I got saved, that means I met Jesus and he transformed my life. I was going to get my driver's license because having been a drug addict for many years, at the age of 20, I still didn't have my license. It wasn't a priority to me. But when I got saved and met Jesus and he changed my heart and set me free, I thought, I want to go and get my driver's license. So I went down to Queensland Roads down there in Southport on the Gold Coast and went to go and get my test. But you see, the thing is, when I met Jesus, my whole worldview changed. Instantly, I only saw people in two different lights, not black or white, not left or right, not male or female, but going to heaven or going to hell. Knowing Jesus or not knowing Jesus, having chosen life or having chosen death. That's the only thing that mattered to me, whether or not you were going to heaven and going to hell. And that hasn't changed even to this day. So I get to the driving test and uh, the instructor comes out to meet me. And, you know, I'm used to driving in the passenger side. So I just walk straight around to the passenger side and I'm about to get in. And he's looking at me like, what the heck are you doing? Mm -hmm. You're driving today. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. So I go back around to the driver's side, open up, get in, putting on my seatbelt. He goes to me, where's the hazard lights? And I'm thinking to myself, you're the driving instructor and you don't know where the hazard lights are. <laughs> then it dawned on me, he's just making sure I know where they are. So I'm like, oh, yeah, right there. You know, the, the little red triangle button. And so, turn the engine on, looking in the revision mirror, backing out, I turned to him and I said to him, do you believe in Jesus? And he just looked at me like a stunned mullet because he's thinking in his mind, I'm anticipating that we're gonna crash and he's gonna meet the Lord. <laughs> so he's just looking at me like, what do you mean do I believe in Jesus? And then I realized what's happening there. So I said to him, oh, oh no, no, no. Like what I mean is I'm a Christian. I've only just become a Christian. And I want to know if you believe in Jesus. And he said, well, I've got a Bible on my desk at work, got a Bible in the glove box and got a Bible on the shelf at home, if that answers the question. And I just remember looking at him thinking, well, I don't think that does answer the question because you can go to church and not be saved. You can go to church and not go to heaven when you die because you know what? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. <laughs> See, it's not about whether or not you attend a Sunday service. It's about whether or not Jesus has set you free on the inside and whether or not you've been born again by the Holy Spirit. That's what determines whether or not you're going to go to heaven. People can go to church every single Sunday and even a prayer meeting on Wednesday night and still go to hell when they die. Why? Because it's not about ticking a religious box. It's about whether or not you know Jesus Christ. And my question to you today, we just jump straight into it, is do you know Jesus? I wasn't raised in a Christian home, had no Christian upbringing whatsoever. I was raised in an atheistic, drug-fueled, domestic violent situation. And at the age of 17, right when I was about to kill myself with a Phillips head screwdriver, the presence of God invaded the room. I came to my senses, realized what was about to happen, bolted outside, looked up into the stars. It's about 12 o'clock at night. And I said, God, if you're real, then I need you to help me because I'm going to kill myself tonight. And I'm telling you right now, as God is my witness, that on that day... At the age of 17, I heard the voice of God. He spoke to me. He called me by my name and he said, Matthew, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be okay. It would take three years in between a rock and a hard place. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It would take three years between a rock and a hard place until I would meet Jesus Christ. And see, in that three-year period, I wanted to kill myself continuously. I had no hope. The scripture says without God and without hope in the world. And that was me. But the only reason I didn't kill myself was because I was convinced that if I killed myself, I would wake up in hell. And it was like a universal truth was pressed upon my conscience. So here on the one hand, I don't want to live anymore. And then on the other hand, I know I can't kill myself because I'll go to hell. That's between a rock and a hard place. 
Drug addiction spiraled out of control. Alcoholism got worse and worse. I'm trying to fill a void that I didn't realize that God was the only one that could fill. And so I'm turning to drugs and alcohol and sex and different relationships and violence and tried to start a boxing career and, and, and just trying to get an avenue to this frustration and this anger. But no matter where I turned, I'd never find the fulfillment. And I'm hanging on to this hope. That at the age of 17, when I was about to take my life with a Phillips head screwdriver, God spoke to me and promised me that somehow, some way, everything would be okay. Well, one day I'm at work for the doll. How many of you know what work for the doll is? So I'm a doll bludger at that time. Ain't no way I'm going to look for work when they're paying me enough money to live off. And so they made me go to work in order to get my doll checked. At the end of the fortnight, I had to go to a feeding, uh, sorry, a, a, a program where they were uh, fixing bikes and toys for disabled children. So I begrudgingly get myself up, drag myself in there, and I, I come to work for the doll one day and I meet this Torres Strait Islander. Uh, at the time, I didn't have dreadlocks, he did. He was probably the first person I ever met with dreadlocks. So straight away, he's looking pretty radical to me. And he pulls out his guitar at lunchtime and starts worshiping Jesus in front of all of us people who just did not want to hear it. But he doesn't care. He's a wild evangelist. He doesn't care what people think. He didn't care what I thought about him. All he was concerned about was whether or not someone had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus. So he's worshiping Jesus. He put his guitar aside and began to share the gospel with us. And I just thought, this is the weirdest person I've ever met in my whole life. This guy is a full-blown tripper. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So. I'm thinking you're a tripper, but we related on this one little level. He's a hip-hop artist. I'm a hip-hop artist. He's rapping about Jesus. I'm rapping about the things of the world. And so we're in this little battle between light and darkness every lunch break. And you know, after he had rapped about Jesus, I looked at him and I said, you know what? I believe in God. And him being the fiery evangelist that he is, jumps at the opportunity, said, awesome, you and me at lunchtime, we're going to go down to the park and you're going to give your life to Jesus. I just remember looking at him thinking, what the heck does that mean? We're going to go down to a park and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. See, you got to understand, he was sharing his testimony with me about how he spent six years in prison for beating police officers. So when he says, we're going down to a park and I'm going to give my life to Jesus, I mean, what's he going to do? Pull out a knife and sacrifice me to his invisible God. I didn't know what was going on. I'm kidding. There was a piece inside of me that thought, okay, let's give this a fair crack. So we go down to the park at lunchtime opposite uh, Centrelink right there in Narang on the Gold Coast. Praise God for Centrelink. So we're, we're there outside Centrelink on a park bench and he leads me in the sinner's prayer. So I pray this prayer after him verbatim, word for word. And for the first time in my life, I called on the name of Jesus. To be honest with you, Wham, bam, thank you, man. Said the amen, and nothing happened. For the next nine days, life spiraled out of control. Clubbing, drinking, partying, drugs, sex, nothing changed. Until one Saturday, Sunday morning, I woke up, shock and hangover, hadn't had a shower in three days, strung out, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm rock bottom, I need, I need to go to church today. So I pull myself together and uh, go to church that day, and as I rock up, I'm expecting stained glass windows with a man in a black cape with a white collar, candles and hymns with a beautiful choir. That's kind of what I'm, I'm expecting. And to be honest with you, I don't care what it looks like because I know I need God. So I rock into this church. It's in a Rotary Youth Center and a basketball hall, chairs are set up, stage at the front, electric guitars, and here's this Torres Strait Islander spinning on his back doing windmills on the altar. And I just remember walking in there, looking around, everyone's jumping up and down, big smiles on their face, and I thought, oh my goodness, he's not the only tripper. This whole place is full of trippers. And I'm just looking at him thinking, what is going on? It's like, it's like, they, it's like they take an ecstasy, and yet they hadn't taken ecstasy. They're on a club without drugs on a Sunday morning worshiping a God they can't see. So anyway, this lady, Janine, walks up, big smile on her face, shakes my hand, smile way too big for the context. But anyway, she's got a joy unspeakable, which I didn't know about at the time. She shows me to my seat. I sit down at the seat. Pastor preaches a message, gives an altar call. And an altar call is an opportunity for people to respond to the gospel, to say yes to Jesus Christ. 
Long story short, that day in that church, I had an encounter with God that radically set me free, totally transformed my life. Jesus said, if the Son of God makes you free, you will be free indeed. In other words, it's not about praying a simple little prayer and still living like the devil and expecting that the gates of heaven will be open to you in that last day. If there is not a transformation inside here, then there is not a place for you up there. Let me tell you that and make it very clear. Jesus didn't just come to slap a new label on you. He came to radically transform your heart and yeah. powerfully set you free. Come on. That's what yeah. it means to be born again. That's good. Come on. Amen. Totally changed. Now that doesn't mean sinless perfection, but it means that your heart has been set free and you're no longer a slave to sin. No longer desiring to get up every day and work for the devil, but there's a change in your heart where you say, God, because of your love for me, I want to walk in you. I want to live for you. I want to live my life to glorify your name. The shackles have been broken. Amen. You know the song. Take the shackles on my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. You know it. Come on. My <laughs> chains have been broken and my, and my life's been radically set free. You know, when I got saved, I looked at people in a different light. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. You either know Jesus or you don't. And I don't mean you go to church on a Sunday and, and pray a simple little prayer. I mean, do you know Jesus or don't you know Jesus? Because it's about knowing him and whether or not he knows you. Jesus was a very accurate prophet. And everything he said has and will come to pass and Jesus said this concerning prophecy which will come true he said not everyone who says to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom but only those who do the will of my father who is in heaven in other words not just those who say they're a Christian but those whose hearts have been transformed by grace and walk as Christians walk in the will of God. Does that mean that we might stumble and fall at times? Absolutely. And yet the Apostle John writes in his letter to the church, he says, Dear children, I write these things so that you may not sin. The emphasis is that you may not sin. Nevertheless, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who forgives us. And what does the scripture say? That if we confess our sins, to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that the Christian life is not sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. No, because if I confess, he cleanses me from all unrighteousness and radically sets me free. Therefore, the Christian life is sin, repent, walk in victory in the power of Jesus who he has set free because that's what it means to know God, to walk in the power of his spirit and to look different to the world. So I want to say to you today, friends, do you know Jesus? And I'm pleading with you today because this is life and death, heaven and hell. I was looking at the world death toll statistics last night on a website and you can see faster than the seconds go by people dying. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I'm telling you, this isn't my opinion. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. The Bible says, he who has the Son of God has life. But he who does not have the Son of God will never see life. But the wrath of God remains on that person. And my question to you is, do you have Jesus? Does Jesus have you? So you might be here today and you used to walk with God, but you've taken a thousand steps away from him. But I want to tell you something. I know I'm speaking very plainly, very boldly, very confrontationally with you today. But you've got to understand that my heart is that you would come to know God and that he would radically set you free. I've experienced it for myself. The chains are gone. I've been set free. Jesus radically transformed my life. And if he can do it for me, he can and will do it for you. This is the gospel. And you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to work hard to get it. All you need to do is wave that white flag and say, God, I've been a rebel my whole life, but I'm surrendering right now. I am surrendering to you in this moment. And if you would save Maddie Russell in that way, would you save me in that same way? And he is not a respecter of person. He doesn't have favor. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. And he promises to do it in this moment, right here today. 
Why is this little guy yelling at me? Because I'm passionate about this. Yes. You have to understand, I look at you as though you're playing on the edge of a volcano and unaware that at any moment you could slip. I can't stand here and politely ask you to step away. I'm pleading with you, run away from the edge of that volcano. Run to Jesus. Give your life to him. He promises to wash away all your sins. And that on that day of judgment, God will look at you, having been washed by the blood of Jesus, and say, this one has eternal life. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into an everlasting kingdom prepared before the foundation of the world. Friends, this is the gospel. I've got a tattoo on my arm. We were just talking about tattoos. You want to know what it says? It says, don't go to hell, please. And Jesus is the only way. You see, he died the death that we deserve to pay the price we couldn't pay to bring us back to God. That's what love looks like. And God loves you this much. Amen. That's how much he loves you. That's how much I'm pleading with you today that you would give your life to Jesus. I don't want you to go to hell and the world's on its way to hell in a handbasket. And Jesus has done everything. On the third day, God raised him from the dead. Jesus ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the Bible says that because he did that, he is able to save completely every single person who comes to God through faith in him. Because he lives forever to bring God and man together in himself. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not when you walk out. You're not promised another second. The only reason you're still alive, able to hear this message right now, is because of the grace of God. At any moment, your life could be taken and you could wake up in hell. But I'm reaching out to you as though God himself were in me, imploring you, be reconciled to God. Come back to your heavenly Father. Be reconciled to God. And what do you need to do? Two things. Repent. Repent. Which means change your mind about the way you've been living and realize that Jesus is the only way. Repent and believe in the gospel. Today I've shared the gospel with you. And the Bible says that you are justified, made right before God through faith in Jesus Christ. And making the decision today to say yes to God. To say, Jesus, by your grace, I'm deciding today to follow you. Then God promises that today you will be saved. This is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes. Friends, I know as I've been preaching and looking around that I can see God moving in many of your hearts. Many of you crying. Many of you can feel the call of God. The pull of God. When I sat in that church that Sunday morning and the minister made an altar call. An opportunity to respond to the gospel and to receive Jesus. In my head, I was saying, I don't want to become one of these people. But in my heart, I was saying, this is why I was born. And it was as though God's love had lassoed my heart and was pulling me to the foot of the cross to surrender my life to Christ. And friends, as every eye is closed, I know that God in his love is lassoing many of your hearts and pulling you to Jesus. Who knows when this opportunity will come again? Who knows when God will pull you and draw you again. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And if you can feel the Spirit of God drawing you, then I am going to ask you in a moment to stick up your hand if you are saying yes to Jesus. And by saying yes, you are making a decision that by God's power today, you will walk after Jesus and follow him and become a Christian. I don't want you to delay. I'm going to count to three. And as soon as I get to three, if you want to say yes in your heart to follow Christ, then in the count of three, as soon as you hear the number three, I want you to lift up your hand. Don't worry about what other people think. This is between you and God. And God is watching you and calling you in this moment. Even as he called me by my name. So God calls you by your name in this place today. Will you say yes to Christ in the count of three? If that's you, I want you to put your hand up. One, two. Three. Hands are going up all over this place. I want you to put it up high. And say yes to Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, six hands, seven hands, eight hands, nine hands. 
ten hands. Father, we thank you in this moment, Lord, that you have seen these hands. And more importantly, you have seen their hearts to say yes to the cross, to say yes to your salvation in turning away from sin to call upon your name. And Lord, I pray that even as you radically set me free 15 years ago, that you would set them free in this place today, that they would have a joy and a hope knowing their sins have been washed away and that today they stand right before God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I wanna just lead you in a prayer really quickly. Those of you who have put up your hand to say yes to Jesus, in fact, I want us all to pray this together. The Bible makes it clear that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want to lead you in a prayer. Friends, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's your heart to follow Christ and believe in his gospel that sets you free. But I do want to lead you in a prayer to call upon his name. So if you would all pray with me. Say, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. There's power in that name. Say it again. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I cry out to you. I cry out to you. I believe. I believe. That you died for my sins. Died for my sins. That you were raised from the dead. That you were raised from the dead. And that I am saved. And that I am saved. Through faith in you. Through faith in you. By your grace. By your grace. I choose to follow you. I choose to follow you. To live for you. To live for you. From this day forward. From this day forward. I pray that you would set me free. I pray that you would set me free. From every addiction. From every addiction. From despair. From despair. From my sins. From my sins. And give me the grace. And give me the grace. To live wholeheartedly for you. To live wholeheartedly for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God.